Marcus Brown's filmography as an actor spans nearly 80 films, including 12 Years a Slave, I Love You, Philip Morris, The Host, and The Big Short. He and his wife also founded Believe Entertainment, producing independent films and pushing them on through distribution. But as a local, Marcus also has great insight into the future of the indigenous film population and the path to create a sustainable industry in South Louisiana. Stay tuned. This is Showtime. Showtime is a weekly podcast where I interview some of Acadiana's most inspiring and influential people. To stay up to date with release schedules, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, all under Showtime Podcast. That, of course, is spelled the Cajun way, S-H-E-A-U-X, Time Podcast. Also, if you'd like to sponsor this podcast, get in touch with me at showtimepodcast at gmail.com. Again, Showtime, spelled the Cajun way. And now, on to the interview. Welcome back to Showtime. I'm sitting here with Marcus Brown. Marcus Lyle Brown, do you prefer going to the full name? What do you prefer? Um, Only in relationship to film, you know, because when I was started in the Screen Actors Guild, I had to give my stage name. So Marcus Brown, I'm sure, is a very popular name. So in order to differentiate myself from other actors who might be named Marcus Brown, I went with Marcus Lyle Brown. Uh, When I first started, uh, Samuel Jackson was really kind of, you know, uh, blasting off, I guess. And right. so I thought about Marcus L. Brown. I said, you know, I don't want to be a copycat. Let me just do my whole name, Marcus Lyle Brown. So, so Lyle is your actual middle name. Lyle it's is my actual state. middle name. Okay. However, when people introduce myself in the industry, oh, this is Marcus Lyle Brown. I kind of look around a little bit still. And like, it, oh, 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 oh right. me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, me. I forgot. That's yeah. what I wrote yeah. down on my That's what card. I said. And that's what they <laughs> see on the on the call sheet. So that's what they say. So Gotcha. But it's not your friendly name. It's just, not my friendly name because yeah, yeah. it's like, it's just long, you know? Right. My wife calls me Mark, you know, some uh, my really? nieces and nephews call me Marky B, uh, you know, it's like, oh, okay. so Mark, uh, Marcus, yeah, oh, that's it. I didn't it. realize that. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Um, so Marcus Brown is an actor, producer, what else? A uh, consultant, consultant um, yeah. uh, technology aficionado. I mean, not just an aficionado, but, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, Mobile application development, video game development, you know, did one for the Super Bowl, did an, mm-hmm. uh, did an Xbox game. Uh, uh, I was a part of a team. And overall an talent game. here in Acadiana. Okay. We'll call it that, huh? All right. A mixture of talent. Okay. Um, let's talk, I don't know much about your history. We're friends, but I don't know much about how you got your start in the okay. industry. Um, are you from Lafayette? Yeah, I'm actually, I was born, I said that today, I was born in New Iberia, Louisiana. My parents lived in Generette, Louisiana until I was seven, second grade, and then we mm. moved to Lafayette. And after that, now let's see, I went to Plantation Elementary, Paul Bro Middle School, St. Thomas More High School, and then I went over to LSU and was there for about 10 years. Gotcha. Uh, worked on a couple degrees and then came back home. What couple degrees? Uh, let's see, I got a BA in uh theater first, I think. And then I worked on my master's in performance training. Uh, it's a professional actor training program. So and when you went to college, you knew that that's what you were going to go into. No, not at all. Uh, I was in speech and debate when I was in high school mm-hmm. and loved it. I mean, every single weekend I was on the speech and debate team, you right. know, which is ironic because that was the first movie that my wife and I produced was about speech and debate, which yeah. was very, not ironic, but uh, I guess serendipitous. Yeah. But after that point, my parents are educators. They both were principals and uh, administrators within Lafayette Parish School System. So me saying I want to be an actor, that was just a little challenging for them. So I went through about six majors. I started in engineering. I was recruited into this uh, rehams program at the time. It was called Recruitment and Engineering of High Ability Minority Students. Students. And uh, there was a lot of math involved. Sure. And I realized that, that wasn't my thing at the point. Now I love math. I love the concept of math and know that it, you know, rules the world. But, um, you know, I went through English and uh, 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 teacher training. Uh, I think it's educational development. I even did some student teaching, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I went into marketing. And then finally, I just got fed up with just kind of discovering. I mean, that's one of the great things about college. You get a chance to figure out what you want to do. And I finally just came back to my parents and said, I want to be an actor. And they, you know, after they fell on the floor, uh, I said, you know, how are you going to take care of yourself? I said, let me figure that out. I said, now, um, I think, uh, they're not, they're they're not not, too mad. They're not that. Yeah. They're not complaining anymore or concerned. What was there a point that it like 
they were totally on board. You know, I'm sure it took a few, <laughs> <laughs> like, they're good now, but, like, do you remember a pivotal moment where I was like, okay, all right, this is not a joke? I do. I do. It was when um, I did a play in at LSU called Sizwi Bonzi is Dead. It's a, a play by Atoll Fugard, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it went really well. Uh, it got really popular uh, at LSU, and my parents came to the show, and my dad basically said, I'm watching the show. And I forgot that you were my son. I'm just watching the show and watching mm-hmm. this guy. And literally, I jolt, it jolted me when I had realized that I'd forgotten that you were my son. Wow. And so I think that was, for my dad, it was that pivotal point. And I think my mom also kind of acquiesced as well. Um, that, was, that, that was the first indication that they saw that this guy, I would be okay, I guess. <laughs> well, that had to be kind of rewarding too as an actor that you were able to transform enough that even your own parents didn't recognize you. Did you feel, you know, successful in your own acting ability at that point? Yeah, there's particularly in that show. You know, I was right. an undergrad and most of the, ma- uh, the the main stage performances at LSU were the, the lead roles were taken on by master's level actors in the master's program that I eventually went into. So being a sophomore, junior in college and being the lead in that show was significant. Getting cast at that level was significant. And then uh, doing the show, I mean, we, the show was so successful and we got so many sold out performances that um, uh, they uh, revitalized it and they brought it back another year. We went on tour with it. Uh, it, it, it did well for LSU theater. I as can well imagine. As, yeah. yeah. And so what was your role again in that? Uh, let's see. I played two roles, actually. It okay. was um, uh, it's a three character play, but a two man show. Oh. And I played Styles and Buntu. Those are my two characters. And so for the first 30 minutes of the show, it's just my character on stage. Wow. Setting the scene. So I, didn't realize that. So, I mean, when your dad said he forgot, I mean, it wasn't like there was an ensemble with everybody. And then here comes, you know, Marcus, you're talking. It was a, basically a solo performance exactly. for the first 30 minutes. Exactly. Oh, wow. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And uh, it, it was one of the, my favorite performances, my dad's favorite performance. He still talks about it. So obviously Speech and Debate had to prep you for that, kind mm-hmm. of being up there and performing. But Speech and Debate is limited to the amount of people unless you get to the, I guess, you know, the state and nationals when mm-hmm. there's a bigger audience. Yeah. So, I mean, were you immediately comfortable giving everything you had in front of an audience? I mean, that's a big difference right or no yeah no uh, just like anybody else i mean it's it's practice you know you read malcolm gladwell you know the outliers Ten Thousand hours it's just like anything else your brain starts to get wired by how much time you spend on something the more confidence you have is based upon how much time you've spent to it usually that's usually how humans are functioning so yeah it was it was a it was a cultivation it was but you were still young so i mean you put in your hours early yeah you know but you know i put in my hours on stage you know Mm -hmm. and so in theater that was one scenario and I got comfortable on stage and I haven't done theater since I've been in college. Film was a new medium for me. And when I started there and even, you know, to some point, you know, today, you, you're always going to be nervous. If you're not nervous, you know, you're not alive, you know, but well, how do you channel not, that? You're not emotion? challenging yourself if you're not nervous. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. You're not pushing your envelope if, it's, if, you, if you're just dialing it in. But, right. uh, the, the more you're able to challenge yourself, of course, you got butterflies. It's how you channel those butterflies and how you make them effective. So what made you transition from theater to film? Um, you know, that's an interesting question. We were in our third year's or year of our master's program and a half of our, it was about six of us. And um, half of us wanted to pursue theater and half of us wanted to pursue film. And our program at the time was very theater uh, intensive. There was no real film training in our program. And we were really pushing for that. And our class was the first time that we did not go out to Los Angeles. That graduating class did not go out to Los Angeles to the Mark Taper Forum and do a showcase. Because that's the whole plan. Mm -hmm. You do the three years. And then at the end of that third year, they take you out to Los Angeles. And you do a showcase at the Mark Taper Forum. And then they invite agents and managers, et cetera. And then they cultivate a relationship. And you go out to L.A. That was the first time that we did not do that. So we had to kind of take some of that into our own hands and said, uh, you know, I was really kind of influential in saying, let's do a short film. If we're not going to do that and half of us are interested in film, let's do a short film. So we shot a short film in our our last year. Um, On film? On film. Yeah. 16 or what? Yeah, for VHS. You know, oh, okay. It was, gotcha. it, yeah, it yeah. was back then. Gotcha. Uh, but, uh, you know, and we cut it or whatever else and did what we had to do. But it was just, you know, and I think myself, you know, I had a great class. 
a great, you know, uh, team of individuals. There are a few. I think about half of us are still in the business as far as acting and the other half has uh, pursued other interests. A um, uh, classmate of mine, Sean Bridgers, uh, is, uh, uh, was in the um, Academy Award winning uh, film Room. Uh, he was the, uh, the abductor, the kidnapper. Oh, wow. And uh, Chantel Thrash uh, is, um, she is. Spoiler alert. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> She's an actress uh, yeah. and uh, a theater professional. She's a teacher as well. Oh, wow. And uh, my other classmates were John Fant, Marjorie, Fitz, Jim, Mar- Marjorie Fitzsimmons, uh, uh, Talia Bodan. So was the transition, I mean, you did it when you were young from theater to film, but, you know, I've listened to like John Malkovich speak and he comes from theater and he was talking about how slow, you know, the difference between for film, oh. you know, theater, you're spending all this time, you prep, and then you just go out there and you do it. It's one time. You might do multiple shows, but you give it all. And for film, it might be like 67 takes of the exact same line. And your line might be three sentences long. Yeah. And so it can get really exhausting. Like, how do you maintain energy, character, that kind of thing? And was that a challenge at the beginning? Yeah. I mean, every single medium is a different type of challenge. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in, in film, it's a different scenario. I miss theater. I miss being able to say, ready, get set, pow, and you're performing for the next Non-stop. 30 minutes, 90 right. minutes, et cetera. And it doesn't stop until you're done. It's a great feeling. You got live interactions and reactions from your audience. Right. You can feel when something is working and when something's not working, you know, and you can make those modifications on the fly because your audience is right there mm. with, with the film. You've got the crew members, but they're technical professionals and there's a director and everything else. They're not, there to react to right. what you're doing. They're there to capture what you're doing. So it's a different type of audience mm-hmm. than, you know, and as professionals, they're still dialed in, but it's a different type of performance and a different type of relationship. Um, and it's a different type of relationship because now you have a relationship with the camera and you have a responsibility to the camera as well as to the connection that you're making with your other actors. So it's a different medium with different focal points. So how is it, um, you know, do you find that people come in as compared to like a film set versus a, you know, a theater performance, there's no cutting, you know, there's no, if you're not feeling it, that kind of thing. Whereas on a film set, you know, you might say, all right, let's take a five, 10 minute break, you know, let the actor get some water, whatever, go to their mm-hmm. trailer. Um, do you find that there's a different type of preparation then that comes in for theater actors? I know a lot of people do both, but do you understand what I'm saying? I, I do. The, the preparation depending upon, um, where your origins are. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, I did a, a, a film with a, a very well-known actor who, uh, two very well-known actors, and one came from theater and one came from film only. Mm-hmm. And so the director gave uh, one uh, us a note and it was a theater note. And the theater actor got it, delivered it, executed it a number of times, and it was brilliant. They had... St- Five different takes that were perfect, right. which were like, I don't know which one they're going to pick because all of those takes were, were right on. Mm-hmm. The uh, the film actor who didn't have any theater training was like, what? What, what do you want to? Well, how do, why don't we just do a couple and see what happens? And it was a, I think there was just this level of um, um, not defensiveness, but, you know, when you don't understand something, mm-hmm. let me put it into a context that I can't understand. So, yeah, there is a different level of preparation to potentially and likely and hopefully get to the same goal. Right. Everybody has a different path and everybody have different experiences and different training, et cetera. As long as you get there, you get there. So if you were to recommend to up and coming actors, do you think starting in theater is a great way to do it? I mean, now since film is so much more accessible than it was for you, um, it's not like them going out with their friends and just shooting a short film would be like what it took for y'all to do back in the day. So yeah. in a sense, you could just go out and do that and get start there. Uh, but do you still feel like theater is a, a good place to start? Absolutely. Um, mm-hmm. There is nothing like it. I'm Like I said, I miss it. Uh, I just did a film with uh, Dan Laurier, the dad from The Wonder Years, and he adores theater. Uh, film, is, film, is, film is good work, but he adores theater. I mean, mm-hmm. he's got, you know, uh, he's got an apartment, uh, literally a block off Broadway and it's it's one of the most amazing you know experiences that I had him taking me into this this space where you just see all this rich theater where so many actors 
come into that space and take a break from rehearsals, et cetera, et cetera. And just feeling that space was the first time I really had a chance to really look at the theater side of uh, New York. And um, um, being in the theater, you don't get that immediate live reaction relationship with the audience. And when you have that, to be able to build on that and take that into film and to cultivate that relationship with the camera is a great gift. And to be able to return to it is even a stronger gift. And I, I look forward to doing that myself. You have um, been working in the industry for many years now. And um, what I like about you is, I mean, you are the definition of a true working actor, right? A lot of people have these aspirations. Well, if you're not a listing every single movie, you know, have you made it? And the reality is it's like your filmography is what now over 80 films. It's yeah. got to be over 80. Yeah. It was like, I remember looking at probably three or four years ago, it was like 79. Right. <laughs> so what, what do you add now? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but it right around that 80, space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah and so, I mean, like you are consistently working for the past, how many years now? Over 20. So in over 20, but I mean, it's, that's four films a year on average. It could be. Yeah, yeah, about that, at least, you know, and it yeah. depends, you know, sometimes it'll come in. I just did this film that's releasing uh, this fall mm -hmm. called uh, Three Billboards of Ebbing, Missouri. Oh, that's the one with um, Francis McDonald. Yep. Uh, and Francis McDormand and, and uh, Woody Har Harrelson and uh, Sam Rockwell. Great film. Now, was it directed it's by? It's not directed by Cohen. No, it is. Ooh, I'm so sorry. I knew you were going to put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> the director, uh, great director. He had a great vision. Uh, I want to grab I'm, his I'm gonna name. Look it up. Yeah, and then I'll just I'll cut him. <laughs> bad, really bad. Um, but uh, as we look it up, I can tell you this: he knew exactly what he wanted, and um, uh, the cast and director for that film, Megan Lewis, uh, you know, recommended me for the project. Is that someone you work with? Before? Oh yeah, absolutely. Martin McDonough. Yes, Donna? Martin McDonough. Exactly. Donna. And um, he had um, and he wrote it uh, the the screenplay and uh -huh. um, yeah yeah uh, directed it. And he had a very, very strict vision for it. Um, I can had, imagine the writer directors, you know, I mean, for them, it's, this is exactly what I want. This right. is how it's I've, done. I've been prepping this since its inception. You know, yeah. I, I'm not signed on to this later on. Yeah, so, no, yeah. absolutely. We shot in North Carolina and they just wanted me for a day. And, um, you know, we had to work things out, but he was really adamant about me being in the project. And I mean, literally it was a, it was a small role. Uh, yeah. And it was flattering that, you know, he wanted me there from Louisiana to come up there and uh, do the project. So I was really glad I did it. And the funny thing was, is that uh, I did another film with Woody Harrelson a couple months later uh, called Shock and Awe. And it was a Rob Reiner film. And uh, when we got on set and we were, you know, working together again, he said, you know, I got a chance to see the rough cut of uh, of uh, Three Billboards. And he said, it's it's one of the two films I'm most proud of. Uh, and uh, he said, oh, it's wow. going to be brilliant. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to seeing it. But I can tell you, reading the screenplay was one of the best screenplays I've ever read. Uh, it, wow. was, it was, uh, it was quite it's a read. It's based on a true story, right? No, but it feels he just wrote it so yeah, well it feels yeah. like it's based on a true story i That's mean really cool. i mean and, and and the characters are so rich that i had painted the characters in a certain scope and when i got on set his scope it was almost it felt like his scope was almost intentionally deceiving hmm. and then when i got on set to see who was playing some of the main characters it made perfect sense but i'll tell you this the whole time I was reading the script, there was one character in that script that I kept seeing Sam Rockwell in that script. I was like, wow, that sounds just like Sam Rockwell. Turns out he was cast. <laughs> Turns out it was Sam Rockwell, you know, so you it's really, eye. yeah. <laughs> so it's really interesting when you see that and you can tell when the writer writes a role for a specific actor mm -hmm. and then to be able to get that actor, uh, it just, uh, it's just, a, it's a, it's a testament to the art form. It's a testament to the industry and it's a testament to the artists to step up and see that and connect to it and fight for it. Was this, a, this is not a first time director, is he? Oh no, no, yeah, no, 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 no. He's done a number of projects and uh, that's why it was, uh, that's why I'm glad it worked out. Absolutely. Um, do you feel like um, the relationships that you've established with casting directors? Cause I know a lot of the movies you have come because of previous experiences and relationships mm -hmm. you have with casting directors. I'm assuming as an actor, those relationships are, paramount and uh do you feel like that is one of the reasons that you are consistently working in the industry oh absolutely um the cast and directors i've developed relationships with um most the anytime that i'm recast and every time that i do a good job 
I don't know if I, you know, when I don't do a good job, but anytime right. I try to do a good job every single time because sure. I know two things are happening. I am trying to make good on the recommendation of the casting director to the, the to the director who doesn't know me. Mm -hmm. And then I'm also trying to make good with the director to say, you made a good choice in working with me and I look forward to working with you again. And I just work. Does that happen often at the end when you're wrapped that you get to speak with the director and it's like a, we hope to get, we hope to, you know, I mean, it's pretty, you know, often that, Hey, good job. I hope to work with you again sometime in the future. And many times it doesn't happen. And, but when it does, yeah. Uh, it's, it's one of the most flattering things in the industry. And I, I can just, imagine. yeah, I just came off a project with, um, uh, director Angela Shelton. Uh, we did a film called heart baby a couple of years ago and in uh, new Orleans, in new Orleans. Yeah. And, uh, she called me, uh, this summer and said, uh, I got another film. Uh, and do you play golf? I said, yes. I said, I want you in this movie. I want to I want to work with you again. Did you lie or do you actually play golf? Oh, no, I played golf. Did you golf. go and start practicing yeah, no, right then? No. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> I hadn't played in a year. Sure. But, you know, I've got, you know, two sets of clubs at home. I, okay. I, I, you know, I got addicted for that time frame, but it sure. was just so much time to 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 become a master at golf. Uh, but I'll tell you what, in this film, we shot in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shot at uh, the summer, the former summer home of Johnson and Johnson, uh, uh, the medical company. Yeah. And it was one of the most pristine views that I ever had. And I Dan bet. Laurie and I play golf uh, every almost every day. Wow. And uh, he's a, he's an avid golf fan. Uh, taught me a great deal about my um, about my game. How many days were you there for? Uh, Nineteen. 19 Whoa. days. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Now we had talked about this a little bit the other day, but tell me about it. This is a low budget film. You know, uh, she was very clear. It's like, this isn't a, this is an ultra low budget project, but we're going to have a lot of fun. We got a great crew and I want to work with you again. I was like, you had me at, I want to work with you again. So yeah. let's figure it out. Right. And we did. And when I got there, uh, what was really cool was that we had a lot of people come from a lot of different places, whether it's New York, LA, Louisiana. I wasn't the only one from Louisiana, which was cool. But, um, uh, the interesting thing was a level of professionalism on set and the level of familial unit that we created made it efficient. Right. There were the egos for the most part, I would say 95% were chunked and everyone was about, we know where we are. We know what we're doing and we know what we don't have. Mm -hmm. Let's maximize. I'm what sure we the do majority have. of the people that are on that set have worked on bigger projects. And that's probably what they do for the norm. But, you know, it, yeah, it's about throwing that ego aside and being able to realize this is a good project. Let's let's bring our expertise that we put on for the bigger films and let's bring it to this movie. There's no reason not to. 100%. The only re the only thing that would prevent it would be your ego. And so being able to put it aside, that's important. And it's not something you normally see in the film industry. So that's really cool when you were telling me that story that the film was run so efficiently and so smoothly and you had professionals, you know. From that perspective... Uh, it gives you an opportunity to say, you know, this is not about, you know, egos. It's about the art. It's about doing something fun. And everyone functioned in that capacity. And I can tell you, um, we made our days. Uh, the days were not extra long. We had fun when we wrapped. People hung out. We've made new relationships. And that's what it's really about. At the end of the day, you, you, you know, hopefully you can make friends, make relationships. And it's not about the business, but it's about the fact is that we actually are artists, all of us. Mm -hmm. And when we take that into account, really some special things can happen. Uh, what was the director's name again? Angela Shelton. So other than her, um, who are some directors that you've worked with multiple times that you felt have been, you know, really pleasant to work with and that, that y'all have made great films together? Oh, well, Griff first. Uh, I've done a, a number of films. Uh, Griff is from LA. His okay. dad was Stephen first who uh, right. recently passed away, but animal house. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. Flounder. And, uh, but he's from uh, Los Angeles, but mm -hmm. he married a Louisiana girl while he was down here, Angela. And uh, now they have a son, Abram, and we've done a number of films uh, together. Yep. Uh, I enjoy working with him. He's, he's extremely effective and efficient at, you know, getting what he wants. And because he not only is a writer, but a director and an editor, mm -hmm. he knows how to capture or get what he needs and can economize and still get exactly what he needs in the camera right? Uh, in an amazing uh, fashion. And uh, Lee Scott, I've also worked with him. He's done a number of uh, projects together. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've worked with... Uh, uh, his name escapes me, but we did a number of uh, a couple of television shows together. Uh, and uh, it was really cool to 
be able to say when we reconnected and we did a we did a show almost a whole year together a television show and uh he was doing a a, a guest star uh not a guest star but a guest uh director uh, on a major abc project mm-hmm. and uh he cast me in that show and he asked me asked for me specifically from a casting director who i had known already as well wow. uh mark finn cannon who uh the finn cannons have been very good to me and very gracious um, and, uh, hopefully, uh, I think they appreciate the work that I do. And, uh, so that relationship, uh, helped out and really gave me an opportunity to do some good work. And, uh, it's really cool to be able to say, Hey, I'll take you anywhere. I was like, that's awesome. You know, and, that is. Uh, and hopefully the, the effort that you do on, on, on camera pays off in that capacity. Has there been a project you've acted in that stands out to you as one of the most memorable or rewarding projects? I have to say that uh, on the on the surface, instinctively, I have to say 12 Years a Slave. And again, that was one of the roles where I didn't say a word. And Steve McQueen uh, let me know at the beginning when he was considering me for a number of different roles. He said, I've decided that I want you to do this role. And he doesn't say anything, but he has a pivotal. Um, he comes at a pivotal point in the story. And I was yeah. like, hey, it's OK. I'm just happy to be here. You tell me what you need me to do and I'm all about it. And you could see that in the majority of the cast and crew members that the story was important. The subject matter was important. The fact that Solomon Northup was a, was a real man and went through these real experiences in the area in which we were filming, mm-hmm. there was a great deal of responsibility and you can, you could feel that level of responsibility on set and in what we were doing. So, and the fact that, that um, the fact that the film received the accolades that it did validated the level of attention to detail, the respect, the, the level of, um, the level of seriousness that each of us took in telling that story, retelling mm-hmm. that story, um, paid off. Um, how, I mean, when you started in the industry, uh, Louisiana had tax incentives, I'm assuming, mm-hmm. but they have grown since you've, uh, since you started, how has that changed the way that you're working in the industry? I mean, you're still here in Louisiana, so I'm assuming that that has helped you at least stay here. Um, but tell me a little bit about that. How, how has that evolved? Yeah, your time? It, 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 it's been an evolution and with evolutions, you have peaks and valleys. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 2002, when the tax credit started, it was a boom and I was a larger fish in a small pond. So I was working a lot to begin with. And then when the industry matured, folks from Los Angeles, Georgia, New York, North Carolina, mm-hmm. were like this is where it's happening. So then that pond got bigger and because I got smaller a little bit, it got, it got more competitive. Yeah. And so from that perspective, you know, it, you, you either up your game or you, uh, you know, you get in line. So you saw a lot of that as well. And you had some options. And then, you know, as the industry started to fluctuate and Georgia picked up and kind of matched the tax credits that Louisiana had in place, all of a sudden Georgia's business became, you know, competitive. Mm-hmm. And you saw a lot of work starting to go there. And we had to get a presence in Atlanta just to continue to work in the Southeast because, you know, in a lot of people fo- uh, think, you know, it's like, okay, I got to go to LA to get my career started. It's really hard, number one, because so many people are there, but you would be surprised at how many people in Los Angeles are now in Georgia, were in New Orleans. That's where the, the you know, on location. And I, I went to the, um, as a consultant for Lafayette Consolidated Government, we were successful in making excursions to the Festival de Cannes and uh, the Cannes Film Festival. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that process, we learned a lot. And we realized that there was an opportunity for the area, but a lot of people weren't aware of how impactful the industry was in Louisiana. But in that process, you get an understanding of how important it is for you to be mobile and how important it is for you to be able to have presences in multiple areas. Mm -hmm. And so in that process, the tax credits went through an adjustment. And when it went through an adjustment, it made the industry a bit ambiguous. And everybody shifted to Georgia real fast. Right. They don't like ambiguity. Right. <clears throat> so the industry dropped by 80% for at least a year, if not a little bit young, longer. So I found myself working in Georgia, North Carolina, you know, uh, all along the East Coast. 
So, and now it's picking back up uh, in this, this year, the two, 2017, 2016, 2017, I was more involved in the inner workings of the legislation than I've ever been. And uh, hopefully my input was helpful. Uh, and I want some of that input actually turn into some of the details that are now a part of the legislation. And it was really cool to be a part of that process and to be pulled into that process based upon my experience and based upon some of the, you know, the challenges that I found as a producer, but I could speak on both sides of that scenario from a producer's perspective, as well as an actor's perspective. Uh, so yeah, I think we're on a rebound. Uh, the industry is not going to be what it once was in Louisiana. Uh, that, that, that great magnet that we had, is no longer, but we have a more stable industry, I, I'm sure, fiscally right. as well as, you know, from an infrastructure standpoint. And it has a lot of promise. And I think some of the legislation that we were able to get passed and the governor signing off gives us a more stable, responsible opportunity to cultivate local filmmakers and really create an industry for individuals. That's what I want to talk to you. Scoot in a little bit. Sure. I think you're approaching. There we go. Um, so... Uh, can you be more specific about the legislation? Um, like what exactly, like you said, staple. I also think of sustainability in that mm -hmm. case. Um, and like you said, um, making sure that we have a indigenous population of filmmakers. That's really the only way that this kind of incentive um, can be sustained for long term. Because it seemed like the way we were going was that we were having all these projects coming in, a lot of money going out instead of staying in this in the state. Um, and so it was great cause it looked good cause we had all these films coming through, but the money wasn't staying. Um, and the way to combat that is to build up an indigenous, which we have such a huge amount of indigenous filmmakers. Uh, they haven't been tapping into the resources as much. Uh, I'm sure. guilty of it. Um, you have actually been one of the few people I feel that has really actually tapped into it, uh, and utilize it for your own production. So tell me a little bit more about the legislation, how you think it can be sustainable, and then maybe about some of the stuff that you've done yourself um, using the, the, the tax credit. Sure. Uh, I guess I'll start backwards in that, um, you know, as a disclaimer, I'm not a state employee, but I have engaged the tax credit program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to quantify that statement, uh, I think I'm one of the few individuals in Lafayette and Acadiana that has utilized the uh, entertainment tax credits. It's still here. Uh, we were successful in recruiting active entertainment and uh, Active Entertainment had a number of sci-fi films, and they definitely engaged the tax credits. We were successful in recruiting uh, Secretariat. They definitely used the tax credits. But as a as a as a resident of Lafayette, who's you know here, uh, we're one of the few. You know, my wife and I are one of the few companies that you know have engaged the tax credit program. But as far as sustainability is concerned, I think this new tax credit legislation and the nuances of it give a great opportunity. They're at twenty five percent, and again, disclaimer. Um, there are 25% baseline tax credit for anything that's spent in the state of Louisiana. Then there was an extra incentive to uh, have the tax credits impact more of the state of Louisiana. So there's a 5% tax credit for projects that are shooting outside of the radius of New Orleans. That's very, very helpful. Uh, there's also a 10% tax credit for projects that are based on a Louisiana screenwriter screenplay. Mm -hmm. Huge. There's right. also a mandate that every single project that is embracing the tax credit program has to be involved in some educational workforce development program, whether it be internships, paid internships, speaking engagements, you know, or a donation to an educational institution, et cetera. That also is a benefit to really saying we want you to connect with, invest in our native workforce to help us cultivate the new gener the next generation of filmmakers and artists, et cetera. So all of those pieces are really important. Now, there's also a quality entertainment company tax credit that provides an incentive, an annual incentive uh, for individuals who companies that come to the state of Louisiana, start in the state of Louisiana and are servicing the entertainment industry. There's a 15% tax credit and a 20% tax credit based upon the salaries that that company has in relationship to it responding to the needs of the film industry. Wow. So it really did a good job of saying, we want you to invest in Louisiana. We want you to set roots in Louisiana. And if you're not setting roots in Louisiana, we want you to connect with those individuals who are setting roots in Louisiana. And we want, want to provide opportunities for artists and screenwriters to really get a second look or a first look at some of the projects that are being developed and are leveraging these tax credits within the state. So I think it's one of our best opportunities 
uh, to really look at that, you know, the long-term sustainability. And I have to admit, it really started with the legislation that uh, our mayor, Joel Robodeau, started with, which was, you know, that native screenplay and really focusing on how we uh, focused and cultivated a an indigenous uh, population. So I think this new legislation is an evolution of that process. So I know some of the challenges, too, with that kind of legislation, though, is that and I want to hear your opinion, is that for like people like me and you, right, who want to create that kind of thing, it's a very good piece of legislation because it helps us. Um, for the people who are the grips, who are the best boys, the electricians, that kind of thing, the ACs, um, that they their primary focus is just getting employed. And those big Hollywood films are the best types of employment for them. And the indigenous stuff is awesome. But for them, it doesn't pay necessarily as much. Mm-hmm. So for them, I know that there was some like, pushback because um, some of this legislation makes them or the bigger Hollywood films maybe choose a different state rather than us. So it's kind of like that balance of, well, this is the only way to really make it sustainable because if not, the, the state will go bankrupt. So you can get your employment from the big films, but it'll be for the next however many years and then it's gone. Or it's kind of finding that balance where it's like we get enough of the big movies, but we don't have necessarily every Marvel movie like Atlanta now does, right? But we're also building the local film thing. So I don't know. Have you felt any pushback kind of similarly to that? You, you get that and it's kind of a catch 22. And I, I understand I love studio films right. as an actor. Of course, you know, as uh, I should have mentioned that actors you know, too, like you exactly, you know, they're, they're great to work on. It's great mm-hmm. infrastructure. It's great pay. Um, nine times out of 10, not nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10 right now, my name is not going to get a studio film funded period. Right. So therefore, the roles that I'm going to be working on on the studio film are going to be some of the smaller roles that, you know, are, are the supporting roles for mm-hmm. that project. So and I and I think it's the same capacity from a crew member side. You know, the director of photography on a studio film, nine times out of 10 is not going to be a local. It's not going to be a local. Right. Every department head, not every, but I would say eight times or seven times out of 10, the department heads are not going to be local on a studio film. However, mm-hmm. When you have a healthy, robust, independent film market, independent film industry, now you're developing the credentials, the repetition, the resume to then be able to interview for those department head positions because you're going to get those department head opportunities on smaller projects. Gotcha. You'll have the experience You can leverage that. Exactly. You can leverage those credentials and and create those relationships. So it is a marriage where... There would not be a film industry in Louisiana if it wasn't for studio films, period. Right. Regardless of what anyone wants to That has to always be kind of like the the bottom line, right? Let's be real. Yeah. However, we are taking responsibility that if we only cater to studio films, as soon as someone provides a better incentive, all that infrastructure and all that investment goes away. They follow the money. It's it's not a marriage. It's a date. Mm Mm-hmm. However, if we're there to help them set roots and expect them to set some roots, then even if they pull away, we're left with something that we can build upon, whether it's experience, whether it's workforce development, whether it's cultivation of new artists and screenwriters and actors, et cetera. That's all beneficial to building a sustainable industry. Louisiana has a lot of wealthy people. You know, I mean, we have good industry here. Is it? You know, is that something that you're looking into more? It's like, why are we not investing more into the arts? Why do we not have, because we could be funding larger independent films. There's definitely talented people here. Why have, Why is the connection between the money and the creatives not there yet? I'm going to, I don't want to say anything that uh, challenges uh, independence from raising money from um, the wealthy citizens in Louisiana, mm-hmm. but I can tell you from my experience, some of the challenges that are there is that the wealthy individuals in the state of Louisiana, and I keep saying nine times out of 10 or more, have not made their wealth from the entertainment industry. Sure. And that industry is a complicated industry even for myself currently right? Uh, from a distribution standpoint, from a revenue generation standpoint, et cetera, et cetera, and a return standpoint. So w- individuals are wealthy because they're smart with their investments and they are some are risk averse. And when you don't know an industry, uh, then there is a challenge with them investing into something that they do not know. 
And when you're dealing with individuals who are more savvy than what they are of how those nuances are, then there's a bit of a, a hesitancy to get involved. One of my, and, and I found that in the projects that we've produced. I mean, we right. have, you know, fiscal responsibilities to our investors and sometimes that fiscal responsibility is out of our hands. Once we get it to a sales agent or once we put it in front of film festivals or we have a co-production partner and it becomes harder for us to be able to help, you know, investors who are not familiar with the industry understand, you know, some of these decisions and some of these scenarios outside of our hands. And sometimes it's a sit and wait and find out how we are, or try to get the best deal. And independent films are, are very, very challenging. I've learned that the hard way that, you know, as the industry grows, the independent market is continuously seeming to shrink. Mm. And so in that perspective, the relationships that independent filmmakers make with distributors and make with broadcasters on the front end is a much stronger, more viable opportunity. It may not be, you know, you may not be in a scenario where you're owning 50 or 80% of your film, but at least you know you're going to get some distribution and you're going to get a return on that budget. Mm -hmm. that you started with because it's very difficult to look at an individual and say, I know we told you that there was going to be a risk in this project, but no one likes to lose at a risk. And sometimes in this process, it there there, there is that level of risk that's there. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate, but we are creating art and hopefully individuals or investors are making an investment or participating for more than just that return. But at the end of the day, Everyone looks forward to that. But if you're investing in art and you're investing in the cultivation of a community and economic development, that's definitely happening. Right. You're definitely seeing that return in your community. I, I can vouch for that. Every single dime that we spend in production has really had an impact on the community. And we've seen and we've tried to engage as many locals as we possibly could in that process so that they can experientially benefit from that process. But also the, the community does as well to understand that you don't have to be in Los Angeles to do this kind of work. There are opportunities here. That's a very good point. Um, tell me a little bit about now the projects that you guys have produced. Okay. Um, because you're acting all the time. Uh, on a lot, You are, you know, multiple projects a year. And uh, but you're also producing some uh, big budget indie films. Um like you said, you know, compared to the Hollywood studios, not big budget, but I mean, for the layperson, you're funding independent films and they're getting released as we're producing independent films. Producing, so, yes. so therefore now, you know, funding, you know, it comes from a number of different scenarios. The first film that we did was a sort of homecoming and mm -hmm. it was uh, based upon a story written by a classmate of mine who reconnected with me 20 years later from uh, St. Thomas More, Lynn Reed. And uh, she said, I wrote this screenplay and uh, I know you're in the industry. Can you read it? I said, sure. And I asked my wife Yvette to read it and she really enjoyed it. So I said, I'll read it too. And I really enjoyed it. And it felt like I was back in high school. And so we spent a year developing the film, uh, myself, Yvette and uh, Lynn. And uh, we found a director and we found our key crew members and we went out and, you know, did all the conversations went out to LA a couple of times and found the right people. And then we uh, uh, raised some, you know, uh, private equity uh, for that project. And, uh, um, you know, uh, she really believed, Lynn really believed in the project and really uh, committed um, a significant investment to make that happen. And uh, we, we got it done. And uh, it was a, a very rewarding experience. And to be able to shoot in Lafayette, to be able to tell a story that I was familiar with, to be, you know, uh, uh, so vested in that process and to be able to find the locations and connect with all the people that we knew in that process was very fulfilling. Yeah. Uh, and so now that project is on uh, Netflix and iTunes and Amazon, uh, et cetera. So it can be seen and it's, uh, and it's got some notable actors in it as well. Absolutely. Laura Morano from um, uh, Disney, Austin and Allie and uh, Kathleen Wilhoit, uh, as well as Michelle Clooney, uh, myself, <laughs> uh, uh, a number and a number of local actors that I've worked with for a number of years and mm -hmm. pulling in those favors and knowing that, you know, I was going to be able to leverage my relationships in Louisiana to get some of the best actors that have been on screen that happened to be from Louisiana, yeah. which was great. And uh, we did the same thing for Dirt Road to Lafayette, which was a co-production between our company, Believe Entertainment and uh, Creative Scotland and Singer Films. And so it was based on a Scottish story with a Scottish writer, Scottish director, Scottish producers. Uh, our, our loan advance came from um, uh, Headgear, and it was um, it was uh, it was a it was a music centric project. 
Uh -huh. And so doing an international co-production process was tedious. Lots of documentation, lots. I of can imagine. Very, very Headaches. challenging. Yes, we <laughs> learned a lot in that process. Right. Uh, the story is beautiful. Uh, we've submitted to Sundance. Uh, so we're waiting on hearing from Sundance, hopefully sometime next month. Uh, also South by Southwest and the Toronto Film Festival. So it took a while. Uh, we were in the middle of the tax credit shift where the state was not uh, buying back uh, tax credits mm -hmm. for a year. So we had to wait on that during post-production. So it really delayed our post-production process and uh, caused a lot of questions from a lot of individuals, you know? Yeah, it was a, a very turmoil-esque oh, year. Yeah, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're, we're all glad that we're past that, yeah. you know, and uh, we've received the tax credits now for that process. And I think that's one thing a lot of people, now the rumor is Louisiana doesn't pay its tax credits and that's not true at all. Mm -hmm. It just got delayed based upon the legislation. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, they've made good on every single tax credit to my knowledge. Uh, and I can vouch for the projects that we've done. And yeah. so uh, they're, they're really invested. The governor's really invested. The state's really invested in everything that we're doing in the entertainment industry, just being fiscally responsible and upfront so that we can manage those investments and so that it can be a balanced scenario and a benefit to the community and everyone can embrace it. It's inarguable to the economic benefits that the program is providing to the state, to taxpayers, to individuals in the industry, et cetera. Everyone benefits from the entertainment industry being here, particularly in the fashion that it's in now. I don't want to keep it much longer. Uh, a few more questions. So me and you have been kind of going around, we're working on some other project and it's, we're asking people what keeps them in Lafayette. Mm -hmm. um, but you haven't answered it yet. So I'm interested, <laughs> exactly. you know, what keeps you here? What what do you what is it about South Louisiana uh, that keeps you here? Obviously, the industry has keep you know is is enough that you can stay here. But but what what is it? What else? Well, I guess I have to look at it from a perspective of where I've been. You mm -hmm. know, um, you know, I've I've, I've worked in um, in Europe. You know, I did a project in Romania. We've traveled to France, and uh, I just got back from London. I've worked in you know uh, on the East Coast and West Coast. And I love Los Angeles. I love Santa Monica. Uh, I love that area. Um, it's, it's, Lafayette is unique, specifically. Louisiana is unique and it's an attractive scenario. New Orleans will always have an appeal that has a worldwide appeal. And I think a lot of it is not just, you know, when you say culture, that's such a ubiquitous term. But when you look at the relationships that are there, the food, the festivals, the smells, the sounds, you know, it feels like home because it is home. I can appreciate the beauty elsewhere, but, you know, if I had to be anywhere else other than Lafayette, it'd likely be, you know, Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And why? It's just because they have a beautiful view and have great, you know, scenarios on the East Coast. But I think with regard to Lafayette, they're in Louisiana. It's just... You know, when individuals get out of a car and it's really hot and it's really humid and you can feel as soon as you open up the car door, some people say it's like, oh, my God, it feels like I'm swimming and it's the humidity sure. and everything yeah, else. Yeah. When I get off a plane or coming from somewhere else, you feel the warmth. And I don't mean the heat. You feel the warmth and you can feel it in everything that you do. And, you know, Louisiana, the South has its challenges has its issues and has its reputation, but you do feel a sense of um, foundation. You do see the terra firma, for lack of a better word, mm. uh, where it's like I can be grounded here. You see some actors in my capacity, or otherwise Morgan Freeman has a place in Mississippi or whatever else. There's some sense of, you know, we can slow things down a bit. We can still move quick like everyone else, but to be able to appreciate slowing down a bit it's kind right. of cool yeah i think that's all i got man i mean there's plenty more to talk about but uh for now this has been a great chat with you and i appreciate you sitting down with me my pleasure thanks for uh having me <laughs> all right did i miss no. anything wait is there anything else that you want to talk about that you no missed? i'm a singer and a lounge singer. no i'm not yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'd love to hear that <laughs> <laughs> me too Thanks for listening to this episode of Showtime. The podcast is sponsored by no one. Well, 
not yet at least, but it could be you or your business. So if you know someone or if you are interested in sponsoring this podcast, get in touch with me, showtimepodcast at gmail.com, showtime spelled S-H-E-A-U-X, time podcast. Also, if you're enjoying the podcast, one of the ways you can really help me out is by making sure you're subscribed to it on iTunes or whatever podcast app you use. It's free and super easy to do, but it helps us out a ton. And if you're really enjoying the podcast, you can leave us a review or a rating on iTunes and on Facebook. It really only takes about 15 seconds. Here, go ahead and do it. I'll wait. Did you do it yet?